you very much. My name is Adam Swallow. I'm the commissioning editor for economics and finance for Oxford University Press. And it is my honor to be able to introduce this book and two of the editors, David and Ravi, who will be speaking to it. And we also have two discussants. I don't know what they're going to be speaking to. Um, <laughs> who will follow up and hopefully um, on matters arising from this, or if any of you have read the book uh, in advance, then uh, there will be an opportunity for some questions uh, afterwards. So uh, you're not here to hear me, so I'll pass straight over to um, David, if you'd like to start us off. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Adam, and I'm thrilled to be here. I'm not an economist by background at all, my own work is at the intersection of law, history, and politics. But years ago, uh, when I was working on war economies, more from a, a political science perspective, I was fortunate to be published by Wider. And I was very, very proud of that when it uh, happened. So I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, the genesis of this book um, was, uh, in a sense, with the International Development Research Center in Ottawa, IDRC. My terrific predecessor, who some of you uh, know, Maureen O'Neill, had commissioned a book uh, for IDRC's 40th anniversary on the uh, ideas that uh, had driven IDRC's efforts. What she got back from two excellent authors was an institutional history, which wasn't what she was aiming for, but it was a very good book. Those of us there at the time thought, well, good, we now have an institutional history, but we're still short of ideas and this history of ideas in the field of development. So why don't we go about that, but losing the IDRC connection. Let's look at the ideas that have driven development uh, efforts internationally since the early 1950s and how experience on the ground at seeking to implement some of those ideas in turn created a feedback loop altering the ideas themselves in several waves over the decades. So that was the uh, basic idea behind the project. Uh, as you can see, it's a big book. Um, we had wonderful authors many of them in the developing world, many of them quite young, I'm happy to say. Uh, and we're very grateful to Oxford University Press for taking the risk of putting out a book with such a diversity of points of view, authors, and so on, under the banner of uh, development ideas and practice. Why was uh, I personally uh, engaged in development, although it's not really my academic field. As a boy of eight, um, I went to live in the developing world. In 1962, my parents moved to Iran, a wonderful country, which it's hard to believe today was then the poster child for development. They were doing everything right. The Iranian government thought so. All of the international experts thought so. In fact, they thought everybody else should be doing what Iran was doing. And what was Iran doing? The Shah of Iran, the ruler of the country, had had to leave his country rather ignominiously in 1953 under pressure of his parliament came back later in the year and realized he hadn't been a flaming success as a ruler if his parliament had managed to get rid of him. And so he needed a project. And his project became a forced march for Iran towards Western-style modernization. And uh, in 1962, some years later, it seemed that was a great success the indicators were all extremely positive. In the midst of this success story, there was occasional turbulence. Six months after my parents got to Iran, there were widespread riots 
which took as their targets evidence of this modernization march, particularly uh, women in professional jobs were targeted. Emancipation of women had been a centerpiece of the project, and women in these riots were targeted. Uh, a name we would later hear much uh, about was behind uh, the riots, but he wasn't alone, Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, but uh, the riots were treated by international observers and by the Iranian regime as an aberration. This is just turbulence, an air pocket. It has no significance whatsoever. The march continued. Uh, in the midst of the march, there were some dissenting voices. A small group of Iranian and French sociologists and anthropologists kept publishing articles in obscure journals nobody read, saying that, in fact, Iranian society was under huge stress, that uh, this program was not popular in rural areas, <coughs> It was not popular in the growing slums of the big cities. It seemed to be essentially popular in the Iranian elite, which made common cause with the international development uh, community. We all know how the story ended in 1978 and 1979, uh, in the decomposition of the regime and uh, in the fact that since then, Iran has been performing way below its potential, as we all know. Uh, although, curiously, women and the emancipation of women has continued in Iran, where many more women wind up in professional jobs today and in the universities than in surrounding countries. So uh, all of this left me, as I remained very attached to Iran, with a deep suspicion of unchallenged expert communities, or insufficiently challenged expert communities, particularly in the field of uh, development. Now, coming to this project after many years of living in the developing world and elsewhere in a variety of jobs, I concluded that uh, although economic factors are tremendously important in development, probably the predominant factors. Ignoring other factors is a recipe for disaster. And a number of international institutions have illustrated that at times by being excessively economistic. What matters in a society beyond, uh, in a country beyond the economy is, of course, as we heard from Kaushik so eloquently this morning, society. Society actually matters. Social preferences, which vary from country to country, which vary within countries, matter tremendously. And unless we accept that and recognize that, uh, our analysis is going to be narrowly gauged and often wildly misleading, as we've learned over the last 60 years. So those were some of the ideas inspiring me as I came into this project, but we were extremely fortunate that somebody much more knowledgeable than me uh, came along to join my two co-editors, Bruce Carrialder and Rohinton Medora, Rohinton an economist, and that person was Ravi. So Ravi, over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, David. We want to leave time for our, for our discussants, really, uh, uh, to raise issues and have group discussions. So I'll, I'll be qu uh, quite brief. Basically, the charge that we gave to our authors, very distinguished authors, and there are 52 chapters, I believe, in the, in the book, covering a very broad range of issues uh, uh, in development, uh, sectoral issues, uh, broad economic policy issues, uh, country-specific perspectives, and so on. The charge we gave to the authors was actually to answer three questions. Firstly, what have been the major changes in thinking in your specific area, uh, whether it's uh, agriculture, whether it's nutrition, whether it's health, whether it's this, whether it's that? What have been the major changes in thinking in your area over the last 50, 60 years? Secondly, what explains this change in thinking? Uh, and in particular, as David said, how has the interaction between the ideas and experience led to a change in the ideas? 
Uh, and thirdly, what are the implications of these changes in the ideas as we, as we go forward? So what was the change in thinking? Why was the change in thinking? And what are the implications? That's, that was the charge that we gave to the authors. And of course, it's impossible for, us, for me, for us to summarize what they, what they came up with. Uh, but what I thought I'd, I'd do just very briefly is to, uh, is to highlight one aspect which strikes me <clears throat> uh, as being quite, uh, quite important over the, last, over the last 50, 60 years. It strikes me how, how much a particular paradigm of the nation state uh, has structured our thinking in terms of development. It is what might be termed the Westphalian paradigm of the nation state. Uh, the unitary nation state uh, deciding policies within its borders and that's pretty much it, okay? That, that's, 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 that's the story, essentially. And of course, that, that paradigm, that, that, that framework has been very important for us, and I think is coming under challenge, both from the, from the positive uh, uh, perspective and from the normative perspective. The positive analysis side is fairly straightforward, and we, we all understand that in terms of uh, uh, cross-border uh, uh, cross externalities, cross-border spillovers, and so on, so I won't go into that. But let me raise uh, one question in terms of the normative aspects of the, uh, of the Westphalian paradigm of the nation state. Uh, and it comes, comes through uh, in the area of development assistance. Um, as, as Andy Sumner and uh, some others have pointed out, the following facts are true. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, 90% of the world's poor lived in low-income countries. Today, three quarters of the world's poor live in middle-income countries. Okay. So the tight connection between an, an individual being poor and the country in which that individual lives being poor uh, is dissolving, has dissolved, is dissolving before our very eyes. And yet the, uh, yet the graduation rules of development agencies, be they, uh, uh, be they uh, multilateral or bilateral, are pretty much designed for the reality of 50 years ago. <clears throat> okay. And, the grad and uh, it's, it's very clear that if we run, for example, the IDA, the IDA graduation movie forward, the World Bank soft loan agency movie forward, in seven to 10 years' time, the fund which was created to engage with the world's poor will be disengaged from the bulk of the world's poor because the design of it was this Westphalian notion that you, go, you target the country and, uh, uh, and, and that's, how, that's how it works. Okay? Now, of course, there are instrumental reasons for using the nation state. But there are also normative reasons, which is, which, is what, which is what I find in a lot of the discussion, that when a country crosses the poverty line, somehow the global moral responsibility for the poor in that country diminishes. And that is, a, that is a, quite a strong notion, certainly in the, in, certainly in, in the polities of northern, of the nor, of northern states. Okay? And the point is that that issue, as, a, as an issue of thinking, as an issue of ideas, did, didn't, didn't arise, didn't need to arise 30, 40 years ago. But it is now there before us. And very interestingly, there's a very interesting debate in political philosophy between, between what might be termed the global Rawlsians, who took the Rawlsian paradigm and essentially globalized it and said, therefore, we're all behind the global veil of ignorance, and it's the poorest of the poor who should be the object of, uh, the object of policy, no matter where they are. It's, it's the maximum principle applied to the global setting. Okay? And interestingly, the major critic of the global Rawlsians was Rawls. Uh, who argued that you, you, you can apply whatever machinery you want, but you cannot apply the Rawlsian machinery to, <laughs> uh, to this argument. Why? Because the Rawlsian machinery is based on contractarian theories of justice, which relies upon, the, es the essence of it is that there's a sovereign and subject, and there's a contract between the sovereign and the subject, and essentially what we're doing is fleshing out the contours of that contract. And that's what leads to the Rawlsian uh, 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 discourse. And the role says, well, however imperfectly, one, I, can, I can see that in the context of the nation state, the Westphalian nation state, the sovereign, the subject, and so on. But you show me where that compact is in the global context. Okay? So in fact, there's been this debate between those who've been trying to use roles, according to roles in a very loose way, to try to, uh, to, try to get at this breakdown between a person being poor and, that con and, the, and the person's country being poor. Well, that's where we are. This, this is how I, the ideas have needed, uh, have, have needed to evolve as the reality on the ground has changed. And I don't think we have a resolution to that. There's a, there's a big debate between so the, the roles on the one hand and global roles in on the other. Well, there you are. That's an example, I think, of how uh, the, the, the Westphalian um, paradigm, which has structured so much of our thinking, uh, now needs to be rethought. Thank you very much. Um,
And so, to Michael, if you'd like to uh, discuss. <laughs> Thank you, Adam, and thank you for this opportunity to, to comment on this, uh, on this volume. Um, I'm not going to talk about the economics or indeed the ergonomics of, uh, of a 1,000 page volume, um, but I am going to sort of uh, take on this idea of uh, what this book is not about, since when you publish a book with 52 chapters, um, what's interesting to me almost is what's not in there as, a, as opposed to what is in there. What is in there? is a wonderful uh, list of uh, topics that would be familiar, I assume, to pretty much everybody in this room. Um, all of the big questions sectorally, all the big questions uh, country-wise in terms of strategies that these countries have followed, um, et cetera. Um, and my full-time job is with the research department of the World Bank, but for nine of the last 14 years, I've also I uh, had the great opportunity and I've been authorized by the, a succession of directors of the research group at the World Bank to teach at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, indeed, our other discussant is a former student of mine. <laughs> um, so the, up, among the many upsides of uh, simultaneously trying to uh, apply what I teach four days a week and then I try and actually make it stick on Fridays a bit, is that you, you get to hang out with the cool kids. You get to hang out with the leading generation of people that are going to be the future for um, taking this whole business forward. And what, I, what struck me upon looking at the table of contents was the, of this book was, in one sense, what the rising generation seems to think is what is all interesting and cool about the development problem and, by extension, what we should do in response to that seems very different. Right? So in one sense, I think this book is a, is a, is a landmark volume in the sense of providing a, 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 a way of a, a representational summary of how uh, the prevailing intelligentsia thinks about development at the, at the moment. But I'm, it, I've always been concerned in some sense that uh, when you talk to our own students today <laughs> about their own backgrounds, what they aspire to, and when you give them a license to set up a conference on development entirely where they get to choose the content, the speakers, the whole bit, they don't set up conferences like this. <laughs> All right. um, they don't talk about, unfortunately, they don't talk about, actually, a lot of the stuff that this book talks about. Right? They don't talk about energy strategies. They talk about kicking soccer balls around in the villages of Kenya that are able to generate electricity at nighttime so they can start little candles. Uh, they don't talk about agriculture. They talk about very specific targeted programs to, to work with poor people. They don't talk about infrastructure. They don't talk about public financial management. Um, and I, it really bothers me that, that they don't. So I think, so when I look at this book, I'm really, uh, um, I think it's an important statement about how, in fact, we should be thinking about development in a very particular, in, in a way that is consistent with how countries in the post-colonial moment envisioned what they thought development was about. And I think it's you know, very telling that in the 21st century, uh, when we look at a, at, a, at a new generation imagining and, and, and discussing and implementing this thing called development, it actually feels, to me at least, uh, rather different from um, how that has been done in the past. So I think we're at a very, the, the, the juncture is critical for me because I think we don't want to be seen as the curmudgeonly old school sort of fuddy-duddies that sort of haven't got with the program and haven't figured out how to create new apps for development and haven't sort of got with the program with regards to cutting edge evaluation techniques and all that sort of stuff. Um, and yet, I, it, to me, it is almost an existential kind of challenge for that if we lose the sense of the historical context and, and deep politics that created the, the aid architecture in which we live, if we don't have the capacity to help our students think through the kinds of philosophical issues that Ravi just articulated, if we don't have a sense that countries like Iran back in 1962 were the jewel in the crown and kind of now they're not, right? And when the epicenter of our thinking starts going towards these very micro-targeted, cool interventions, I think we've lost a lot, actually, about what this business that we're in is actually all about. So I love this volume just because it really tries to lay down, I think, a really comprehensive statement about what big development questions are about. It's about agriculture, it's about infrastructure, it's about jobs in a, in a big sense of what we can get states to implement. And I worry that we're losing that. 
Um, so how we reconcile all of these things, to me, uh, seems to be the big thing going forward. Take a look at the chapter on evaluation for that, right? You talk to my Kennedy School students now about what a, what a, what a course on program evaluation should be about. When I took that class as a, as a student at, the, at Harvard 20 years ago, it was all about trying to assess the impacts of subsidies and uh, the way in which whether we should be uh, what sort of balances on controls we should have in order to be able to maximize the net present value. Uh, what do the cool kids think they're taking a class on now when they take something called program evaluation? How to do an RCT, right? The beauty of this chapter on program evaluation is that it rightly doesn't dismiss any of that. It just says RCTs are one tool among many. <laughs> uh, there's a whole bunch of other issues that we have to wrestle with when we're trying to make or defend claims about the effectiveness of entire ministerial portfolios, about organizations that we work for. All of these are evaluation challenges, and yet that's not what the cool kids are learning. That's not what they're studying. And I think, uh, so for example, one passage in this chapter is about something called process evaluations that uh, Ray Porson and others have do. I would, without putting asking for a raising of hands, how many people who teach in development programs in this room would teach a class or even know what uh, something called process evaluations are? Not too many, right? So it, it, I think that's why I say this is a landmark volume for me because of the content and especially the tone that it sets with regards to how we in the 21st century are true to the, the legacy, the professional legacy and the, and the imperative for what development meant and yet also find ourselves at a very, uh, uh, big crossroads moment almost in terms of how we define development in a very basic sense. And um, if it's allowed to be exclusively seen as targeting micro uh, uh, information technology based solutions to the concerns of specific people living in specific times and specific places, then that's, we've kind of lost something really fundamental about what this business is about. And I love this book precisely because it helps us to get back to a world in which what we really can and should be talking about is these big political public management uh, questions about how we can get 21st century states and 21st century sensibilities to be able to engage with big 21st century problems. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, Landina. Thank you very much. It's hard to follow once my professor speaks, but I'll try. Um, I really enjoyed uh, reading the book. Um, as Ravi said, it's 52 chapters, so I had to be selective. And one thing that struck me most uh, is related to what I'm doing now in Tanzania and uh, pretty much looking at the structural transformation. So very quickly, I looked at the chapters that are talking about transformation and the one and only I see uh, Monga here and uh, Justin Lin, that was uh, informative. And then there was another one on rural transformation and also a little bit about uh, how Asia has, um, Asia is a model of development. I thought that one was also very interesting. In another one, as the, the one that was sharing experiences from uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I will not discuss the, the chapter by Monga and Justin, because I know they have a session later, and I think they'll capture that. But the one that struck me most was with regard to the rural transformation. And in particular, because uh, a lot of times when we implement policies, for instance, in Tanzania, we look at other countries and we simply copy um, what they're doing without looking at the, the evidence within our own country. And I like the classification that the, the, the authors of this chapter uh, shared. For them, for instance, uh, it is one thing when you're speaking about uh, having a rural area, it is something else when you're talking about rural development, and it is totally something else, again, when you're talking about rural transformation. And I really like the distinction that they've created. In such a way, it forces you to think outside the box when you are to advise any policy makers or any um, um, actors who have to uh, put up a project. But then, out of that then, one thing that I also liked a lot from this uh, particular chapter was the historical uh, transformation that they have seen with regards to ideas. Ravi was talking a lot about that uh, they had asked uh, authors to do that. And you could see like uh, the three main things that they, they pick as the issues that are driving um, a rural transformation. The first one is with, with regards to diversification of rural economy. I really like the idea that 
a lot of times when we think of the rural people, we simply think they work in agriculture. But for them, they put everyone in a gradient in such a way you could be in Denmark, but still be in a rural setup. But then come again, as Michael was saying, how do you cater for those people? What you find is right now, a lot of people are being left out just because the normal classification that is existing is taking them out. Now, the other thing we talk about a lot, which they also touch about, is with regards to globalization of agri-foods and system. We talk a lot about uh, value chains and what they do to us, but then the approach that the, the authors take is cautioning us that it is one thing to follow a system and people get rewarded accordingly, but it's something else if systems are not put in place where some people are going to be hurt by the system. And I thought that was a very uh, strong statement coming out from, uh, from them. And the last bit, which for me, yes, I knew about it, but I never thought of uh, having it in the way the authors put it up. It was with regards to the urbanization. And for them, they grad urbanization, not necessarily moving from a rural area to the big uh, cities, but rather going to the medium and smaller, uh, smaller cities. And for them, they call, if the word can create environment whereby a lot of people can move to the small and medium cities, that will tend to include more people. But wanting to jump from rural areas straight to the urban areas, then we see lots of the problems that we are, uh, we are seeing in our countries. Um, and then maybe just to finish off uh, with one thing that also I really liked that they linked also to the urbanization discussion was with regards to once people are developing, especially their view was with the rural uh, population, once people are developing, it is one thing to think about, um, to think about them being better off we as outsiders, and it's something else for themselves to view that. And they give a very good example uh, whereby we as economists talk a lot about being trapped in poverty. And for them, what they warn about is not being trapped in poverty, because they say that is just uh, a persistent level of deprivation. But if you're trapped in an equality trap in any country, that would be the worst situation. And they explain, in some countries, even when they develop, the people who are still below continue to be trapped there because the people in power will continue uh, to push them um, and want them to be there. And I thought that was very, very interesting. And I'll end there. Thank you very much indeed. So, um, there's a few other uh, statements and, and uh, factoids uh, <laughs> about the book and uh, supporting materials, but I'll come to that in uh, 12 minutes' time. <laughs> so in the meantime, there's a couple of microphones, and you have an opportunity. I'll give priority to those that have read the book. Um, <laughs> no, they want to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Why should you buy the book? That's the first question. So if there's a, a show of hands and identify yourself, if you'd like to ask uh, the rector of UNU, Ravi, or one of the discussants, then uh, now would be your opportunity. Yes, sir. Uh, Han from UNU, and I have read uh, some chapters of the book. I'm referring to uh, chapter 36 on ICT <laughs> oh, yeah. for development. Um, I think the authors did a very good uh, job of giving a history about um, technology and development, um, how it was seen to, uh, to deliver people from uh, uh, dire situations. Uh, but of course, we've learned that it's not a panacea. Um, but, uh, so what is the current thinking? Um, how do we approach technology in development? Uh, does it still deserve a place as a focal point to borrow from Kaushik in the morning? Or is it better uh, to see it as something that should be mainstream in the sectors like education and health? Thank you. Michael, I um, wondered if uh, the cool kids and the apps... <laughs> Um, if it, their response to ICT and development. Uh, the, the good part of this book is that it has, it, you know, tips its hat to that stuff, says, yeah, sure, that's really interesting. It's one thing going on in development. But 
there's a means ends distinction here, right? And I, and I want us to focus, the, prob the problems we should be focusing on are all these big fundamental sectoral questions around infrastructure, around agriculture, around energy, um, and fixing health, public health systems. And then ICTs become useful to the extent they help us solve those problems unlike how we tend to think about it, I think, today, which is that they become cool in and of themselves because they've got lots of bells and whistles around them and then we can ooh and ah our way at them and think that by, just by virtue of their appearance that they become useful. They're useful to the extent they help us solve a problem. And um, so what I like about this book is that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't say this stuff doesn't matter, it doesn't sort of assign it to sort of third order status, it just says the first order status is these big sectoral questions of social transformation and political transformation that are, that, that's, that's what the development challenge is and everything else should be assessed in some sense to the extent to which it helps us engage constructively, legitimately, effectively with those particular problems. And so. Uh, that's the criteria or the, the space within which I think we should be assessing the, 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 uh, what the 21st century has given us, which is a whole new technology for engaging with these questions. Great. Um, but, you know, there was a whole bunch of previous eras of new technologies that came along too, and the, so history is, is really should be a source of uh, instruction for how we make sense of all this. Anyway, I'm speaking too long. Let the authors do <laughs> It's their book, not mine. <laughs> Um, on a lighter note than that, um, I, was, uh, I used to live in India, like many people in this room, and as you know, uh, India is a country you come, you come to love very often, and I was going around with a very serious friend who was looking into local impacts of the spread of ICTs in India, and this friend was extremely upset to find that the main local impact seemed to be that people were able to enjoy very cheaply calling their cousins at the other end of the country, that in fact ICTs had brought joy and to a degree liberation from isolation, so to speak, to many uh, um, uh, Indians. So uh, that's one dimension, I think, of uh, ICTs that's been lost track of. Yes, they can be extremely useful in the economy, but in society, they've had a very big impact, which is favorable. And satellite television has had, in many ways, much more impact in India than telephones. Why? Indians in rural areas are much better informed now than they used to be, and it makes them more demanding of government, and uh, it puts government under more pressure than it used to be in some decades gone by. Uh, give you another factoid, uh, nothing to do with the chapter. And, and what I'm about to say is not about that chapter, it's that there's a basic rule, which is that 10% of the authors give you 90% of the problems. <laughs> so bear that in mind, those of you who go in for big editorial, uh, editorial uh, uh, tasks. What I was going to say is that when, when, when David said the ICT had brought joy and uh, whatever, I thought he, for a minute he said RCTs had brought joy. <laughs> Yes, please. Hi, I'm Rachel Gizelquist from UNU Wider. Um, so this is, as, as Michael was saying, a hugely ambitious project, and it covers a wide variety of topics, and so I'm sure it always invites questions about what's missing. Um, so with apologies, I wanted to ask a question about, about what's missing. Um, it struck me in looking, in reading uh, some of the, the book and in looking through the table of contents that there's, there's nothing on ethnic divisions and ethnic diversity uh, and the relationship between ethnic divisions and development, uh, which of course has received quite a lot of popular attention and research attention, especially in political science, looking at, say, the relationship between ethnic divisions and public goods provision and ethnic divisions and slow growth in sub-Saharan Africa. <clears throat> so. It's also a topic I think that resonates quite well with both of your, your comments about the, about the topic this morning, or this afternoon. So I guess my question broadly is about how did you decide what topics made the cut and, then, and which topics don't, and, and why specifically this one didn't make the cut as a, as a chapter? Uh, great. Well, thanks so much for your comment. And you're right that uh, there's a great deal of literature about this in other places, but not so much in development. So it's a very good question you raise. 
When you take on a topic as broad as development ideas, you really have to pick and choose. And we had a lot of telephone conferences, Ravi will remember. The hardest part for us was first the table of contents, which we established at the outset before we even thought of authors. And then to try to find the best authors we could corresponding to uh, the topic. Uh, so that's how we proceeded. Uh, one or two topics dropped off the list, by the way. Not this one, I should add. It was never there. Simply because um, we couldn't either find the right authors or the right people weren't available. But we did try to make sure that the principal topics were there. One other thing I'd like to mention as an editor, I don't know if Ravi would agree. He's edited many more books than I have, uh, is that peer review was very helpful to us. When we first took the outline of the book to OUP, of course, they sent it out to peer reviewers. Um, and the, the comments that came back from the peer reviewers actually profoundly influenced uh, the way we decided to go. The peer reviewers had their own blind spots because they didn't know a number of the people who we were hoping to involve because they were young and new and so on. But the depth of their advice uh, and the relevance of their advice to a volume of this sort, uh, I'm struck when I think back to the project how important it was to us. So for young authors inclined to be very, very impatient with the peer review process, as I have often been, it can be extremely uh, helpful. Yeah, let me just say that some of the uh, country-specific uh, papers do address the thing when, when it's relevant in that, in that context. Uh, but I'm very sympathetic to the point that you raise in general. I mean, I think, it, particularly in light of the, the Westphalian points that I was making earlier, uh, and I've sort of spoken about this before, that in some sense, uh, one, can, one could view the African, the, the, the African post-colonial project as being one of trying to construct a Westphalian state from those straight lines on the maps that have been bequeathed to, uh, uh, bequeathed to Africa by the colonial powers and so on. So I'm, so I'm very sympathetic to what you're saying. And though some of those issues are indeed taken up in the individual country-specific uh, uh, point, but, but, I, but, I, but I'm very sympathetic to the point you raise. I haven't read the book, so I'm totally innocent. Uh, but I'm looking forward to read it after what I heard. However, I'm a bit struck by the discussion that's sort of the us, us the book, and them the non-book. Us, the big things, the big policy issues, first order of importance. Them, the cool things, the ICT, the RCTs, kind of the bottom up, etc. Right? I would hope that there is room for both. I would hope that the key is, is complementarity. I would hope that what has been achieved very importantly in the last years is precisely to kind of democratize development, to open opportunities. Students at the Kennedy School, students at Berkeley, students at j and whatever can have a chance to participate, to identify low-hanging fruits that can make a lot of difference, that can also be areas for learning, for demonstration, what can work experimentation, failure, successes. Right? So I think it's good to kind of re-elevate the game, maybe the Deflow of Energy work book be sort of in contraposition to maybe what Michael has been discussing here. But let's not close the door. Let's see complementarities. Let's give value to what has been achieved in recent years. But let's not forget, in a sense, that the state is important, transformation is important, big issues are important, and we need to see complementarities. We may have lost some perspectives in that sense, and the book may kind of help us rebalance the issues, but certainly not at the cost of turning our back to what has been achieved. Thank you very much for your comments. And on that note, um, there is, in addition to the book, uh, there is the website, uh, which is developmentideas.info. Uh, when the authors were invited to submit their chapters, they also invited abstracts, keywords, uh, a further reading list, uh, a list of questions. And during the author workshops, most of them were videoed as well. 
And so as a teaching resource, the book, uh, the website, contains the questions, the further reading. It's also got the working paper versions of the uh, chapters as well. Um, which, and it's all free and accessible, and this has all been arranged with IDRC. And if you want to keep in contact with the website, of course, it has its own Twitter handle, which is at dev, L, uh, dev ideas. There you go. How cool is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, for those who are uh, a little more uh, old-fashioned, uh, there are copies of the book uh, available outside for sale, and we have order forms so that you wouldn't even have to carry it. You can order it and have it delivered to you, courtesy of Oxford University Press. On that note, can I thank the panel? Can I also record a, uh, my thanks to all of the contributors and to the uh, IDIC uh, administration who helped to facilitate the book and to the organizers of this conference for allowing us to showcase it for you this lunchtime. Thank you very much. Thank you.